Welcome everyone. My name is Esther Lee, president of Chinese American Heritage Foundation. Chinese in America endures abuse and discrimination in the late 19th century, but they have a leader and a fighter in Wang Qingfu, 1847 to 1898, whose story is a forgotten chapter in the struggle for equal rights in America. Our important book talk today is The First Chinese American, The Remarkable Life of Wang Chin Fu by author Scott Silliman. Scott is an award-winning writer, a historian, a retired corporate executive, and a career China hand. He holds an undergraduate degree in history and American civilization from Princeton University and a master's degree from Harvard University. Fluent in Mandarin, he lives in Taiwan, Hong Kong, China for eight years and read and write Chinese. He has worked as a legislative assistant to a member of a US Congress, lobby the Chinese government on behalf of American business, manage a multinational public relations agent in China, serve as a spokesperson and communication director for a Fortune 50 company and taught both Chinese and English. He has written four books on early Chinese American. The others are Three Tough China, um, Chinamen, Tong Wars, The Untold Story of Vice, Money and Murder in New York's Chinatown, and The Third Degree, The Triple Murder That Shocked Washington and Changed America Criminal Justice. He is living in Washington, D.C. right now. After the presentation, we have Q&A. Our moderator is York Lo. He is an investment management professor, uh, professional who is also very passionate about history. He is a board member, member of the Chinese Historical Society of New England, where he launched and chaired its Tony Lee Memorial Lecture uh, Series and the 150 Years of Chinese Students in America Initiative. He has also written many articles and several books in English and Chinese over the years related to the history of his native Hong Kong and Chinese overseas. And if you have any question during and after the presentation, please type the question um, in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. So now let me uh, welcome Scott Silliman with his presentation first. Good evening. Um, let me start with a word of thanks to um, Esther and Wilson and to the Chinese American Heritage Foundation for arranging this talk, and also to my friend York Lowe for agreeing to moderate it. York and I have actually never met uh, until this evening, but we've been corresponding for years, and we have a lot of common friends. Um, I actually found my way to York while I was doing research for a different book, a book called The Third Degree, which is about a Chinese man um, accused of murder here in Washington, D.C. In, in the year 1919. And his book, which was written in Chinese, was called Dongsheng Xijiu, was uh, invaluable to me in the research. So that's when I first wrote him. Uh, and we've become uh, pen pals ever since. I'm very grateful to him for agreeing to, um, um, to, uh, to moderate the question and answers later on. So um, let me um, also let me start with an apology to those members of the Chinese Historical Society of New England if you are a long-term member of that organization and were a member in 2014, you may actually already have heard this talk uh, because I gave it up there in that year. Um, but if you're patient, you'll find that I've also included a few updates at the end. Now, my plan is to talk for about 20, 25 minutes tonight, and then I will be uh, very happy to take your questions at the end. So let me share my screen and then uh, get started. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see the slides now. Um, well, um, let's start here, okay. America's various civil rights movements have all had their, their Susan B. Anthony's, their Martin Luther King's, their Cesar Chavez's, their Gloria Steinem's. But who can Chinese Americans point to? Chinese were egregiously discriminated against during the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, but most people, and I would include most Chinese Americans in this, can't name a single Chinese leader who stood up for his, um, for his community during that era. And I'm here tonight to tell you about one. Um, I think his story um, is a shining repudiation of the impression that I certainly had before I took on the project of writing about him, 
that 19th century Chinese bore everything that the American established dished out quietly, passively, and without very much protest. The truth is America's Chinese had a leader and a fighter in this man, Wang Qingfu, and he's someone of whom I think Chinese Americans, really all Americans, I believe should be justly proud. Now, I first saw Wang's name on an internet list of the most prominent Chinese Americans. And most of them were people like I am Pei, uh, Maya Lin, Gary Locke, Yo-Yo Ma, or if you wanna go back a little bit further than that, Anna Mae Wong. But almost all of them were 20th century figures. Many of them are still very much alive today. Wang was described as a civil rights activist who had opposed the Chinese Exclusion Act. And since I had understood that the Chinese community had more or less cowered in a, in a defensive crouch and permitted this horrible piece of legislation to be brought down on their heads without protest, I decided I'd really better learn a little bit more about this Mr. Wong and see if I could figure out something about who he was. So what I find out, well, Wang was born in Shandong province in North China um, as a, a, to a well-to-do family that uh, had fallen on hard times. Now this immediately made him different from almost every other Chinese who was in the United States in the 19th century, almost all of whom were from one part or another of Guangdong province. Um, but when the first missionaries came to uh, the town of what they called Chifu in those days, the foreigners called Chifu, the Mandarin was Zhifu, today we call it Yantai. Um, in the year 1860, Wang was uh, with his elderly father and uh, his father couldn't raise him. He was too old and he was too poor. And um, so he asked the missionaries to handle the task for him, basically to raise his son. I think he was about 13 years old at the time. And so beginning at the age 13, Wang, who was then known as um, Wang Suiqi, was romanized as Wang Saqi, but uh, it was Suiqi. And, and we found that out only, uh, only very, very late in the process, what the Chinese characters were. Um, he lived with a Baptist missionary from Virginia, a woman by the name of Sally Holmes. And Sally realized how bright he was, and she had in mind a promising future for him as a preacher. The American missionaries that went over there realized that they couldn't reach all of the Chinese that they wanted to reach in their, in their goal of converting uh, people to Christianity. And they decided that they would, the best thing to do would be to convert Chinese who would themselves become missionaries. So she decided that he had a, a real possibility that he could be a Christian missionary. Uh, she had him baptized. And when he was nearly 20 years old, she brought him to America to uh, complete his education. And he studied at two Baptist schools in the United States. The first one is here in actually in Washington, DC. It was called Columbian College at the time. Today it's George Washington University. And then you're looking at his uh, report card, uh, which I uh, found in the archives here. And then when he was done there, he didn't really last that long, just several months. When he was done there, he moved to Pennsylvania to, to Lewisburg Academy, uh, a school that we call uh, Bucknell University today. And he finished his studies there. He claimed to have graduated with honors. My research shows he didn't graduate and there were no honors, but you know, Wang occasionally would fabricate little pieces of his life uh, when it suited him. He did pretty well, but he never actually finished his studies. What he did instead was he went back to China. It was past time to get married. He was already old uh, by Chinese standards. Um, so he got married in, uh, back in Zhifu in, in Yantai and he joined the custom service first in Shanghai and then eventually he went up the river to uh, Zhenjiang. Um, and, and in those days actually uh, customs in China was actually run by foreigners. So they had a real need for interpreters. And this was a Chinese man who spoke and wrote exquisite English because after the age of 13, his education in was entirely in English, first by the missionaries in China and then eventually in, in the United States. So his English was excellent. But he soon got into trouble for his, in he, was, he was very anti-Qing dynasty. He got involved in an unsuccessful insurrection against the Qings. It was ham-handed, it wasn't very well planned and it was, and the Qing dynasty was never in danger of falling because of Wang Qingfu, but he did get on a list and um, he would have been executed had they found him. So he had to get out of China and he had to get out of China fast. And what he did was he left his wife and a newborn son behind. The son weighed only 12 pounds when he left and he sailed back for America in the year 1873. He wouldn't see China or his family again for a quarter of a century. So now he's back in the United States and what's he gonna do? He's gotta make money. He's gotta support himself. 
So that's when he adopted his adult name of Wang Qingfu, and he began a career as a lecturer. He traveled in the East and the Midwest. He didn't spend much time on the West Coast. Um, and he would lecture about Chinese culture and Chinese manners. He was the first Asian many people in the Midwest had ever seen. And, but pretty soon he discovered that he had to go from explaining the Chinese to defending the Chinese. Because after the Transcontinental Railroad was finished in 1869, many Chinese were put out of work. And at the same time, the nation was experiencing an economic recession. And the willingness on the part of the Chinese to work for low wages put them at odds with unemployed white Americans. The result was a lot of malicious scapegoating and racial stereotyping, also violence against Chinese in the West. And it culminated in 1882 in the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which halted most Chinese immigration for 10 years and also rendered America's Chinese, all of the Chinese, about 100,000 Chinese in the United States at this point, it rendered them all ineligible for American citizenship. Um, well, Wang himself actually got in under the wire. He became a citizen in 1874 in Michigan. Um, and he did it, he actually, I think, lied in order to get citizenship. The, um, the rule in those days was that you had to file a declaration of intention to become a citizen and then wait five years before you could finalize it. He actually applied, he uh, uh, filed his declaration of intention and became a citizen on the same day. There was a loophole in the law that said that if you were in the United States continuously, I think for five years and had been under 17 years of age or 18 years of age when you first arrived, then you could bypass the five-year rule and become a citizen immediately. Well, Wang had not been in the United States for five years. He'd come when he was over 18 years old, but he didn't tell anybody that. And I don't think anybody ever figured it out until me. And he was, he was long dead and safe from, um, safe from harm by then. Anyway, he became a, a citizen in 1874. And as he preached, as he went around lecturing about the Chinese, he spoke a lot about religion, which was something he knew something about. He wanted to refute the notion of Chinese as godless heathens who, were do who a lot of Christians felt were doomed to eternal damnation because they didn't know Jesus Christ. And he became persuaded actually that one of the PR problems that the Chinese had in the United States, one of the reasons that Americans we had become hostile to the Chinese was actually those American missionaries in China who were writing their letters back to their congregations, trying to get more money to support their missionary activities in China. They had to make China look pretty bad in order to do that. So um, he got angrier and angrier with these reports from the, from the field that the Chinese were depraved and godless. And he decided he was very clever about this. He was in Boston, actually, and he gave a very imaginative speech. He proclaimed himself, uh, sorry, that's, I didn't mean to switch the slide there. He proclaimed himself China's first Confucian missionary to the United States. And he sang the praises of Buddhism and Confucianism in ways that he felt that Christian Americans might actually find familiar. Obviously, his remarks were tongue in cheek, but they earned him condemnation from church members. Um, and it eventually it culminated in an essay that he wrote for a journal called um, the, uh, the, the North American Review, which was the, um, the leading intellectual journal, I guess you'd say, in the United States during this period. He wrote an article called, Why Am I a Heathen? And it really wasn't about heathenism. It was really, what it really was, was an attack on Christianity. And it caused a firestorm of protest. He really got a lot of people very angry with him for writing it. But Wang had become slowly, slowly fairly anti-Christian because of uh, what he thought the missionaries were doing to the Chinese reputation. Well, he settled in New York in the 1880s and he became a journalist. And in 1883, Wang Qingfu launched the first Chinese language newspaper east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, the Chinese name was Mei Hua Xinbao um, or, uh, or, uh, or Cantonese Mei, Mei Hua Sunbo, which is what most of the people who were reading it would have, would have pronounced it. But it wasn't the Chinese name that was important. It was the English name. The English name was the Chinese American. It was the first recorded use of the term Chinese American in history. The paper didn't last long. Um, Wang had no talent for business. He soon ran out of money, but it raised his profile and it permitted him some other opportunities to uh, counter some anti-Chinese prejudice. Like for example, the 
Why the, the, the saying in America that Chinese people ate rats. Um, and this was a serious allegation against the Chinese. The New York Times wrote a whole article about whether they, analyzing whether Chinese people really did eat rats. Wang offered um, a $500 reward to any American who could prove the popular accusation that Chinese ate rats. And of course, nobody could, nobody came forward. That was the end of it as far as he was concerned. But he had an instinctive sense of public relations before there was such a thing as public relations. Wang knew how to get attention and he used it and he used it strategically. Well, as a journalist, he wrote lots and lots of articles in English primarily. And his goal was to demystify the Chinese people and Chinese life, not only in China, but also in Chinatowns. And um, in one particular, actually in one particular essay that he wrote about Chinese cooking, it was it appeared in a Brooklyn newspaper. He was the first to introduce the term chop suey to American readers. Um, and, um, and the, oh, sorry, there's the article. I'm, I'm a slide behind. And um, after the passage of the Exclusion Act, and you're looking at the Exclusion Act, it was only two pages. After the passage of the Exclusion Act, Wang became active in politics. In 1884, he convened all of the naturalized Chinese in the New York area. And there weren't that many of them who had actually gone through naturalization. But he convened all of the naturalized Chinese in the New York area to form a political association. It was short-lived, it never had a name, but it was the first assembly of citizens of Chinese origin in American history. And also the first indication that Wang Qingfu had begun to see the, the Chinese who wanted to make a commitment to become citizens in the United States in a very different light from the Chinese who were just coming to America to make some money, build a nest egg, and then retire back to uh, Guangdong province. And he began to focus on very narrowly, uh, he, he no longer pushed too hard about the restriction for future Chinese immigrants uh, uh, to come to the United States. In fact, he actually said that a lot of Chinese in the United States supported that, that there were a lot of Chinese laundrymen who didn't want any more competition. I don't think that was true. I think that was self-serving. But he focused instead, not on the immigration part, but on the citizenship part of the Chinese Exclusion Act. He thought that it was outrageous that Chinese could not become citizens. And so he began to focus on what the Chinese needed to do to Americanize in order to make themselves attractive candidates for citizenship. And he was very clear on what that meant. He gave a definition of Chinese American. It meant number one, to learn English. Number two, to adopt Western clothing, not to wear uh, Changpao anymore. Um, to shave off the cues, the bienza, the hair cues, that Chinese still wore in this point um, because, um, uh, and they kept them on in the United States because to go back to China without your queue um, during the Qing, you could actually be, uh, be executed. And finally, to give up gambling and opium smoking, which were vices that a lot of Americans associated with American Chinatowns. And he felt that if Chinese could do those four things, learn English, dress like Americans, shave off the hair cues and give up gambling and opium, then, they, then people would realize that they were good potential candidates for citizenship. Well, the problem with that was uh, Wang was really fighting a two front battle here. He not only had to convince the Americans that the Chinese were law abiding people that they didn't need to fear, he also had to persuade the Chinese, the, his own countrymen, that there was value in acculturation, even as the messages that were coming from white America were so hate filled and discouraging. Neither task was easy. And sometimes he feared for his own life um, from other Chinese, because when he was preaching against gambling and opium smoking, those enterprises which were going on in Chinatown were Chinese owned. And so a lot of the uh, undergrad, underworld Chinese, some of the Tong members um, decided that uh, he was an enemy and he had actually narrowly escaped death a few times. Um, the, the, um, the word in the slide there, high binders is, we don't know, use that anymore, but it meant, it basically meant Chinese bandits. Well, Wang took on the most famous of America's Chinese critics. It was a man named Dennis Kearney. Uh, Kearney was born in Ireland, which was ironic because he was the apotheosis, he was the um, uh, apostle of um, uh, nativism in the United States. He wasn't even a native himself, but he was a demagogue. He was a very skillful public speaker. And he personified what they called the Chinese must go movement. Wang, who was always cocky and more self-assured than he probably should have been, 
he dared Dennis Kearney to debate him. And when Kearney refused, Wong challenged him to a duel. And the newspapers had a field day with this. When a reporter asked him what his preferred weapon would be, Wong said, well, I would give Kearney his choice of Irish potatoes, chopsticks, or uh, German guns, whatever he wants. Um, and in 1892, Congress renewed the Chinese Exclusion Act for a second decade. And it added a requirement uh, that Chinese had to be um, registered and photographed and that they had to carry their, um, their certificates around with them or risk arrest and or deportation. America's Chinese were furious about this, and they resolved to see the new law either repealed or declared unconstitutional. Wang established this new organization called the Chinese Equal Rights League in order to get the law repealed. And under the aegis of the Chinese Equal Rights League, he testified before the Congress. And although his effort failed, uh, the, the, same, the same Congress that had just passed the extension of the Chinese Exclusion Act was very unlikely to repeal part of it, which is what he was asking for. But the effort, so the effort failed, but he was very likely the first Chinese ever to appear before the US Congress. Well, um, in the 1890s, he, went, he spent more of his time in Chicago than New York. Um, there he pursued several causes simultaneously. I think he was a little overwrought. Um, number one, when both of the major political parties refused to support his call to repeal the Exclusion Act, he said he was gonna establish a new party of his own. Um, he published two more Chinese newspapers. Um, he made an aborted attempt to establish a Confucian temple in Chicago, but not for Chinese, just for whites. And um, he hatched plans to help overthrow the Qing dynasty from a South Sea island and establish a junta from in Chicago that would rule China after the fall of the dynasty. I don't think he was thinking entirely clearly at this point, and I think he was a little overwrought. In 1896, he almost certainly met Dr. Sun Zhongshan, Sun Yat-sen. Um, and if you want to know the specifics of why I believe that, you can ask me in the Q&A, and I'd be, I'd be very happy to tell you that story. Well, when it came to the end of Wang's life, I came up empty. As far as English sources go, he apparently just fell off the face of the earth in 1898, was never heard from again. We did know that he went back to China in 1898 by way of Hong Kong. Um, but I didn't really know how to end the book because I didn't know how he had died and what had happened to him before he died. Um, so I did what um, any good scholar would do, any good researcher, when I, when I couldn't Google him anymore, in English, I Googled him in Chinese. And sure enough, I found an article on the Chinese web uh, written by a man named Wang Fan called uh, Wang Qingfu, the Chinese Martin Luther King. Well, as I read through the article, I realized that Wang Fan was a descendant of Wang Qingfu. He was his great, great grandson. And I figured, well, I've got to get in touch with this guy, but how to do it? All I knew was his name was Wang Fan and he lived in China. And believe me when I tell you, that's not easy to find. Um, so I put a, fr a Chinese friend in, um, in Beijing on the task, and um, he found out that this blog post actually had been published previously by a different publication. He contacted the publication. The editor had left, but they knew how to contact her. Um, took about two weeks before they contacted the editor, and she still had Wang Fan's business card. So my friend called him up, and then I got an email the next day, and he said, Scott, Wang Fan is, is as excited to meet you as you are to meet him. And the reason became clear. Wang Fan actually is a historian himself. That's him on the left. And um, uh, he's a, but he's a historian of the, of the Gung He Guo period, the communist period, rather than the, the, um, the, um, the, the Qing period, the dynastic period. And um, he, um, knew very, he knew that his great-great-grandfather, Wang Qingfu, had been an important figure in the United States but he was unable to do the research himself because he doesn't speak any English. Uh, he did, however, have a couple of treasures in his possession. He provided some letters to me that his great-great-grandfather had written in the last few months of his life. And they shed light on his activities and also what he was thinking, what he had finally concluded about his, his, his work and his life. And um, those letters were invaluable to me. They essentially wrote the last chapter of my book because I finally knew how Wang had died and, um, uh, and what he was thinking when he died. 
Well, I met Wang Fan. Uh, this uh, this is taken in my apartment several years ago. That's his uncle, um, Wang Xiangzhen on, on the other side. He's a, his uncle is a great grandson of Wang Qingfu. Um, Wang Fan is a great great son, a grandson of Wang Qingfu. And they were both very hopeful that a Chinese translation of the book um, could be could be worked out. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Well, I mentioned before that when uh, he first came to America, Wang had studied at what's now uh, Bucknell University. And when this book was already in page proofs, the publisher was Hong Kong University Press. Um, uh, while the book was already in page proofs, I was asked by uh, the alumni magazine of Bucknell University, Bucknell Magazine, to write a story about him for their spring edition. And um, after I finished the article, I wrote to the Bucknell archives who had already helped me before with a couple of questions. I wanted to do some fact checking just to make sure that the article was completely accurate. They had already done the research. They had already, they had never found anything, but they went back through their archive a second time and they came up with a surprise that had not surfaced the first time around. Um, it was a photograph. Now, my biggest heartbreak in the two years that I researched and wrote about Wang Qingfu was that there was, I was unable to locate a photo of him. Not even his family in China had one. When I first contacted Wang Fan, I figured, look, great. You know, they're for sure going to have a picture of him. They didn't have a picture of him. The only one they had ever seen had been destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. I had always had faith that a photo would turn up, but one never did. And the best image that we had of him was this sketch, which was actually made from a photograph. The original photograph had been taken by a very famous photographer in New York. But I contacted all of the archives that had the work of this photographer and asked if there was any photo of an Asian man, and there simply weren't. So uh, I had agreed with the publisher that this was the picture that we were going to use on the cover of the book. Um, well, um, what they found in the files at Bucknell was this photograph. It was a studio portrait of Wang Qingfu taken in Pennsylvania in 1870 when he was about 23 years old before he shaved off his own hair cue. Well, I got to tell you, I just about jumped out of my skin when I saw it. I mean, I felt like I knew this man intimately, but I'd never seen him before. Um, and I immediately wrote to Hong Kong University Press and I said, look, I know that it's gonna require some repagination of the book, but we've simply got to use this photograph in the book. It's the only known photo of Wang Qingfu. And they didn't hesitate. They were very, very accommodating. It set our schedule back a couple of weeks, uh, but, but they were able to include it not only inside the book, but also on the back cover of the book. And needless to say, the Wang family was thrilled to get a copy of it. But uh, that wasn't the end of that story. Um, the Bucknell image turned out to be the key to several more discoveries. In April, through the good offices of a professor, a Professor Jack Chen at NYU, he was then at NYU, I think he's at Rutgers now, I received four scans of photographs of, from a, a collector in the Midwest named Philip Chen, who was a friend of um, Jack's. Jack wrote me an email. He said, Scott, I'm looking at these pictures and they look a lot like your Mr. Wong. I wonder if you would take a look at them. And uh, we knew for sure that it was Wang Chinfu because his name appeared on the reverse side, um, the name Wang Saki, which as I mentioned was his childhood name. So from that one photo at Bucknell, we were able to authenticate four more and eventually another, a fifth photo that had previously been labeled anonymous. I'll show them to you. He's wearing his uh, Bienza, his cue in all of the pictures, which tells me they were all taken fairly early. Here's another one. Can't tell whether he's got the cue there or not, but this one you sure can. Wang Fan thought it was a fake. I, was, I thought it was real. We, we disagreed on that one. And then um, uh, several years later, a friend of mine bought a photo at auction on, on, um, on eBay um, and we were, Pretty sure this was Wang Qingfu, although he had glasses on, we didn't know he wore spectacles. But this was the photo that gave us the Chinese characters for the name Wang Saki, which is Wang Sui Qi. And finally, we knew how to translate his childhood name into Chinese without just reinventing it and, and coming up with you know, characters that had not been his name in the first place. Um, okay, um, next year is gonna be the 80th anniversary of the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and Wang Qingfu certainly did not live to see it. He didn't even live to see the 20th century. But no one deserves more credit than Wang Qingfu, I think, 
to, for waging the good fight against this piece of legislation. The timing is appropriate, I think, for a re-examination of this story. Few of the institutions that Wang Qingfu built survived him. And those that did, um, uh, those that lived on after him uh, didn't live on for very long. Um, he was human. He could be stubborn. He could be sometimes not entirely honest. Um, he had his, Lord knows he had his flaws. But in the main, I believe he was a very principled man. He believed very deeply in justice, equality, and enfranchisement. And he challenged Americans, white Americans, to live up to the values that they, on the one hand, they so freely espoused, but on the other, so utterly failed to apply to the Chinese who were living in America. And more than 70 years before Dr. King dreamed of an America that judged people according to the content of their character, Wang was saying essentially the same thing. Uh, listen to this. He, we, we therefore appeal for an equal chance in the race of life in this, our adopted home. A large number of us have spent almost all our lives in this country and can claim no other but this as ours. Our motto is character and fitness should be the requirement of all who are desirous of becoming citizens of the American Republic. I got to tell you, I'm a native speaker of English and I don't write as well as this man did in English. He really he just had a beautiful, beautiful feel for the language. Well, Wang set a pattern for what he thought being Chinese American should mean that is more or less what it has come to mean for millions of people. I think he deserves to be remembered not only for envisioning the goal, but also for his creativity and the amount of energy that he expended trying to achieve it. And he, I think he's no less of a hero for the battles that he didn't win. And there were certainly many of those. So finally, what qualifies Wang as the first Chinese American, which is what I chose to call the book? He certainly wasn't the first to come here. Uh, tens of thousands of Chinese reached America before he came in 1867. And while most of them probably planned to return home, many of them did stay on. Uh, a handful of them even became citizens before he did. He was not the first Chinese to take out American citizenship, although he was one of the first. But Wang Chinfu was the man who was most concerned with hammering out what this new identity of Chinese American ought to mean. He labeled it, he described it, he modeled it, and he promoted it, not only among his compatriots, but also among other Americans. And I think it's on that basis that I can claim that identity as the first Chinese, a true Chinese American uh, for Wang Qingfu. Now, the other entries on that list that I started with, the notable Chinese Americans, they were actors and actresses and architects and inventors and businessmen and women and physicians and politicians and journalists and scientists and civil servants. I mean, the whole gamut of professions. And I can't help thinking how proud Wang Qingfu could be if, if he could see this list and, and appreciate the breadth of the achievements of Chinese Americans who come after him. Now, what I wanted to end with is um, um, the book itself was published in 2013 in, um, uh, in Hong Kong. And um, we've been trying ever since that time to get a, um, a Chinese language edition published. And it has been a hard slog. Uh, the rights were purchased by a state-owned publisher in China. They let them lapse after they did the translation. I actually worked with the translator. Um, because I told, I told them that some of the English in the book was sort of 19th century English and a Chinese translator might have trouble with them and I made myself available. And I corresponded actually for a whole year with the translator going back and forth. And I'm, I was pretty sure he did a very, very good job on it, but we couldn't get approval for publishing it. And then another Chinese publisher bought the rights and they couldn't get approval to publish it. But finally, we got the news a few months ago that approval was forthcoming and that the book was in fact going to be published in China. And since then it has, it's under the title uh, um, Wang Qingfu de Gu Shi. It's not yet available in the United States, but I'm working on it. And um, if you're interested, uh, there's a, I've got a, a Facebook page and I will announce where it can be purchased in the United States as soon as some copies of it get here. Um, but it's available in China. And I am hoping that, um, that it'll be available soon. Of all of the books that I've ever written, this was the one I most wanted to have in a Chinese edition, because I really think that Wang Qingfu's countrymen ought to understand him as well as we've come to understand him here in the United States. Well, let me unshare my screen now and um, come back to Earth. And um, 
I would be, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to York and I would be very happy to answer um, uh, any questions that anybody wants to pose. Great, Scott. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it is my real honor to, uh, to be moderating this. Uh, uh, I think in addition to the long list of different, uh, you know, you were lobbyist and writer and PR executive and uh, teaching uh, Chinese and English and you, I, I would say that you're really a detective <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> I guess uh, part of it. Uh, yeah. You know, when I, you know, as you mentioned, we get to know each other through, you know, uh, your book, Third Degree, where which touch, you know, one of the the, the victim sadly was, um, uh, is actually from one of the family that I covered that was the director of Chinese students. And for the longest time, even all the family members did not know the accused uh, murderer, uh, the, the Chinese name and the origin of his background. And there are many guesses and you were the one who really did the, the Sherlock Holmes <laughs> or deep investigative job there and able to, to find out and I was surprised that actually this person was that the, that person was related to uh, to someone who was one of the the 120 right. Uh, right. students who first uh, the, the first from the Chinese educational mission. So uh, really, you know, applaud you know for you for your detective work, and uh, and I also want to mention that uh, you know many your books you have such great storytelling in terms of you know bringing. Uh, a lot of very interesting early Chinese American story to life, uh, and some of them, you know, uh, for example, I heard that uh, the the uh, Wang Chinfu now there is a play called Citizen Wang. Yes, yes. <laughs> somehow. In so New I'm York. looking forward to you know to Tong Wars and other the three China uh, Moy brothers uh, turn into some sort of uh, play or movie. But uh, I guess I'll go with the the questions. Uh, maybe I can start with one of my own first. Sure is uh and and somehow there were two questions that somehow were there before i think i can from my memory uh, uh you know bring it back but I, maybe i ask one first uh is um uh related to you know as esther mentioned i'm involved with the uh the chinese students uh initiative the 150th anniversary and of course one of the we actually just did a talk chesney did a talk uh, that covered yan fu li who you know wrote an essay that is somewhat Yes. related to what Wang Jinfu uh, wrote. So maybe if you can uh, talk mm -hmm. about that episode, uh, yeah. that story a little bit. Well, this, uh, this publication that I mentioned, the North American Review, they were doing a whole series of articles on various religious and even non-religious philosophies. And there was like, you know, why am I a, a Baptist? Why am I an Episcopalian? Why am I a Jew? Well, you know, why am I a Mohammedan? A whole series of these. And Wang got the assignment to write Why Am I a Heathen, mm. which he did. And it was so controversial that the editors decided in this case, they needed a rebuttal. And that's why they went to Lian Fu, to Yen Fo Li, who essentially wrote an article called Why Am I Not a Heathen? Mm. No other ism or ideology <laughs> got, a, got a rebuttal, but this one did because uh, Wang had really rattled a lot of cages with this. I mean, there were people who were denouncing him from pulpits. And Yen Fo Li basically said, well, no, you know, um, there's nothing incompatible about being Chinese and about being Christian too. And I, I am a Christian and I do believe in this. So it was, um, I, I'm not sure that the two men ever met. I suspect they probably did because they were kind of um, traveling some of the same mm. grounds and stuff. Um, but the, um, the, uh, the, the comment I think I made in the book was, here you've got two Chinese men, both born in China, mm. in the United States, arguing about Christianity in English, in, in fact, in beautiful English, both of them mm -hmm. wrote extremely well. And I thought to myself, that's something that probably never would have happened in China. Mm, right. That's something, I mean, really shows what being Chinese American was. You know, all you have to do is look at that particular interaction and, uh, and you almost get your answer. And I guess, uh, you know, if you, any, any information from Wang Fan or other further research, it did, Wang Qinfu, actually, how was Wang Qinfu able to go back to China since he was kind of a fugitive from the law a little bit, right, in terms of trying yeah. to overthrow the regime and all that? Well, it's, it's actually sort of and, a sad story. <laughs> right. um, he was still persona non grata in China hmm. when he went back, and he was quite worried, actually, that they might come after him, which they actually did. He hmm. went to Hong Kong and first, and in Hong Kong, he applied to the U.S. consulate for an American passport. Hmm. After all, he was an American citizen. He had yep. naturalized and he had never been denaturalized. Mm -hmm. And so he applied and was given a passport. And then the um, consular officer apparently cabled the State Department 
and was told he had made a mistake, that mm. the American government policy was not to issue passports to Chinese people of any status. Now, it was frankly an egregious mm. decision because in order to be denaturalized, he would have had to been, that have been done by a court. Mm. And that's not the arbitrary decision of the State Department. But the, but the decision of who to issue a passport for more or less is within their discretion. So this consular officer tracked him down in Hong Kong and pulled the passport back before he was able to go into China. The reason he wanted the passport was he felt it would give him a certain amount of immunity from justice by the Manchu, by the Manchus, the Qing dynasty. So he went in without mm. it. He had a reunion with his um, wife and son. His wife was ill. Mm. Um, in fact, he hadn't even been in touch with them for many years, but his son had found him in the United States and written him a letter. He had a reunion with them. Um, and then the word came that the Manchus were looking for him. So, and he was in Shandong at this point. So he mm. went to Weihai, which, yep. was, which had recently transferred um, ownership or mm. whatever it is, rental to the British. It was a British um, a possession at that point. So they couldn't get him there. But he had gotten sick on the boat ride to Hong Kong. He had lost a lot of weight. He was sickly at that point. And it was in Weihai that he died. Okay. And I see one of the questions later on, where is he buried yeah. from Stephanie? Yep. Uh, that's the answer. He was, he's buried in Weihai. I don't know that the grave is marked. I don't know anybody who knows where it is. But that's where it happened. And did he, um, so we answered actually two questions, uh, I think. Yeah, sorry, uh, that am I was, going too fast? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. The, uh, so did he kind of maintain his Christian faith until the very end? Do we know have no much detail about? Uh... His Christian faith? No, no, yeah. no. He abandoned Christianity early on when mm. he got pissed off at the missionaries. He was done with Christianity. In fact, there was no going back after he wrote that essay about mm -hmm. being a heathen. Yep. I mean, it was, he really excoriated the Christians. Um, so no, he was, um, I think he was, um, uh, he was pretty much done with Christianity. So he would okay. not have had a Christian burial unless the British gave it to him. I don't know. Hmm. Okay. And another question from Mel Yang is, uh, yeah, you know, does he have any, I guess, does uh, Wang Chintu have any descendants now living in North America? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, his um, great grandson lives in North Carolina with his family. Um, and there are other uh, descendants living in California. I've met several of them, as a matter of fact. They've come to book talks or, um, or we've corresponded, um, you know, one way or the other. Uh, and they're all very much aware of his history. And, um, and they've all been really delighted with the photographs. Uh, you know, as a genealogist, I can tell you how valuable it is to me to be able to find a photo of my great, great grandfather. And um, uh, for them, you know, this was, this was something that was lost. It was never going to be found again. So um, everybody was pretty happy about that, as was I. And delighted. And I guess another question I have is, I guess, uh, early, most of the early Chinese Americans are of kind of Cantonese descent, right, from the yeah. five counties and stuff. So, and, and so with uh, Wong being from Shandong, right. how do you think that he communicated with, uh, well, you he, know, he picked up some Cantonese or, I mean, it's hard to. I'm sure he picked up some Cantonese. He right, claimed right. he was fluent in Cantonese, okay. but he also claimed he was fluent in Japanese and none of those things were true. Mm. Um, the truth is his relationship with the Cantonese was quite curious. Mm. He, um, he looked down on the Cantonese. Mm. Um, he, one point he said, you know, here are all these people that are, you know, sending their children to live abroad in these various countries and stuff. He said a good family in Shandong would never do that. <laughs> he, he basically confused the geography with class. He thought that the camp Cantonese were low class and that he wasn't. And, um, and he had some, you know, uh, unkind words for the Cantonese who I'm sure felt exactly <laughs> the same way about him. You know, if you were a Chinese in Chinatown in New York or in, in, in Boston or someplace like that, if you met another Chinese, your question would not be what part of China is he from? Your question would be, is he Samyap or is he Seyap? Is he, right, is he yep. from, you know, what part of Guangdong province is he from? This guy was from Mars as far as the rest of the Chinese were concerned. He spoke Mandarin, which they didn't. Um, and, and was he physically, I mean, Shinon people are known to be kind of tall, right? Was he, I, I don't know where the description of his Yeah, uh, I don't think he was terribly appearance. tall. Okay, right, right, right. But yeah. the other thing that, that's very interesting is if you actually try to read that damn newspaper that he wrote, the, uh, the Chinese American. <laughs> oh, me, me, it, uh, oh, yeah. oh, it's unbelievably difficult, even for a very educated hmm. Chinese to get through that today. Part of the reason was it was, um, it was not entirely literate. I mean, they would just use a phonetic character to fill in for one if they didn't know how to write it. That's number one. 
mm. lots of names of streets in New York that they transliterated as you know, mm. however they wanted to do that make no sense at all in Mandarin. But if you read them in Poisson dialect, all of a sudden they sound like Mott Street, you know, things mm, like that. Right. Um, and, um, and lots of expressions that aren't really used. And um, mm. the truth is Wang didn't write it. He had a scribe mm. who did it for him. He would tell him what to write and this other guy would do the writing. So I believe that a, um, a, a Cantonese reader in the 1800s, 1880s would have had no trouble understanding that newspaper. But today, nobody really, can, it's not easy for anybody to understand it. Um, so anyway, he claimed, and, and one other story about that, he claimed that he could uh, be a translator. And every so often he was called to another city, like if a Chinese was accused of a murder or of a, or, or of a crime, mm -hmm. sometimes Wang was called in to translate for the person in court. And um, he claimed that he was, you know, he could handle Cantonese as well as Mandarin. Well, he couldn't. And there was one humiliating case where he translated for some Cantonese guy. And in the audience was an American, a white American guy who had served in the consulate in Guangdong. And the guy took a, filled a whole notebook with mistakes that Wang Chinfu made translating for this other Chinese guy. He was, he was conceited about it. He said he could speak all these languages, but he really mm. couldn't. He could just get by. So we got a new question from Grace Toy. I guess uh, she's just wondering, where did your love of Chinese uh -huh. American history come from? Um, Grace, I was an American history major in college. Um, and I was probably going to go to law school, not because I wanted to, but because my father wanted me to. And I got an opportunity. I, was, I went to Princeton. I got an opportunity uh, after graduation to, to go to Taiwan for two years to, uh, to teach English. And it was better than law school as far as I was concerned. So I said, yes. And I went to Taiwan and I was able to pick up basic Mandarin, which in 1975, when I came back to the United States was not a marketable skill. It was like mm. learning Latin in those days. Um, so I went on, I did a graduate degree um, uh, uh, and I, I, I went on in my career and I found myself in Washington DC working for a member of Congress in 1979. And in 1979, all of a sudden, we now had full diplomatic relations with China. And speaking Mandarin was the only thing that made me any different from anybody else in Washington, DC. So I managed to find a job with an organization called the US China Business Council. Hmm. And they were just getting established in China and they wound up sending me out to Beijing to um, manage their office for a year or two. Um, and um, so, so essentially my career by accident became, a, um, became part and parcel of my work with China. And for most of the time I was in the working world, I was doing something back and forth with China. The history part of it just sort of came naturally. You know, you get to be curious about a country that you've more or less adopted. Um, the truth is I've always felt like a phony when it comes to Chinese history, because I never formally studied it. I never studied classical Chinese, which anybody who was a China scholar has done. Um, but it was an interest. And, um, and the truth is that most of the research that I do for these books is in English anyway. I can get through a Chinese document with some difficulty and with a dictionary next to me. But um, for example, I can't read the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese um, translation of the book um, fluently easily. Um, in order to, when I check the translation, what I would do is I'd copy the text from the Chinese version and put it into Google Translate and see if there were any alarm bells that went off. But um, uh, you know, my Chinese isn't all that good anymore. It's also been like a dozen years since I've really spoken it. But I do, I mean, you know, you fall in love with, uh, with, um, uh, uh, with a country. And in my case, it was China. I don't know how to describe it any more than that. Okay, and another question, I guess, from my fellow Chesney director, Stephanie Fan, is how many copies of the, uh, the newspaper, I guess, specifically the Chinese American exist and where can you find them? I, I know <laughs> of three copies of, the, uh, of that newspaper. One is at MOCA in New York City. Mm, okay. One is it the, the uh, New York Historical Society, I believe, has one. Hmm. And the Chicago Historical Society has not only one of that, but they also have one of one of his Chicago newspapers that I actually flash on the, uh, on the screen. Um, but uh, Stephanie, if you, um, if you write to me, um, and if you're interested in this, I'll send you a PDF or, a, sorry, a JPEG Im image of it. And the way to write to me is just go to my website, um, seligmanonline.com, and you can write me through the website. Uh, I'd be very happy to send it to you if you want to try to read it yourself. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd be curious to read the, the content too. Uh, 
And just kind of wondering, I mean, following on that newspaper, was it financed by most of the kind of local Chinese merchants or who, who were some of the no. backers? Anyone well-known that you might Nobody well-known. I think, it were, I think they okay. were white guys. But Interesting. Wang, was, okay. Wang was a colossally bad businessman. Hmm. He overprinted. He printed, I mean, uh, 10 times the number of copies that he would need because there weren't that many Chinese in New York to hmm. buy the damn thing. And it only lasted maybe six, seven months, something like that. Uh, and then they ran out of money, and that was the end of the newspaper. Um, so, uh, and everything, every business enterprise he touched turned bad on him. He really, that was not his talent. He was an ideologue. He was, he was a scholar. He was very intelligent. He was moral, but he was a terrible businessman. Hmm. Good to know. And I guess uh, you briefly mentioned that, you know, he probably, although the book is called First Chinese American, probably not the first Chinese American citizen. Right. Have sure you actually, sure as not. a result of this research, any evidence as who with, was actually the first one? Well, the first to take citizenship out is generally believed to be Rong Hong. Okay. Yong Wing. Yeah, yeah Yong Wing, yeah. Yeah. And he did it very early, the 1850s, I think it was. He was the first to graduate from American mm -hmm. University from Yale. But I believe he was also the first to take out citizenship. And I've seen records of at least a half a dozen other Chinese who naturalized before Wang Qingfu did. Um, and then once they passed the Exclusion Act, you know, all of a sudden there was a big question mark as to whether these people were even citizens anymore. Uh, in fact, um, Rong Hong had to sneak back into the United States hmm. uh, after he went back to China. And that shouldn't be. I mean, if you're a citizen, you're a citizen. But, um, you know, go argue with them. They're all dead. <laughs> Right, and I guess an, another question I have is, uh, so you, I think you mentioned Wang Qingfu kind of left his wife and child in China. Right. While he was in America, was there any domestic partnership or anybody, did, did, did any records of that? Or? It was actually a very sad life that he was living. The answer mm. is yes. There okay. were a couple of, I was able to ferret out a couple of relationships with women that he had. Mm. One was a prostitute mm. uh, with whom he fell in love, but that didn't go anywhere. And the other was actually somebody else's wife with whom I think he was wow. having an affair. Okay. But, you know, his life in New York was so um, um, marginal that mm. at one point he was, he kept all of his belongings in a trunk that was um, in a Chinese restaurant that he knew. And he would sleep wherever there was a free bed. If somebody went out of town, that's where Wang would sleep. Mm. He, and he said, talked about it. He said, you know, I'm not interested in money. I'm not interested in things or anything like that. I'm not trying to enrich myself. I have a, I believe in, you know, what I, my, my causes. And that's why I'm, that's why I work. So the, um, the answer is there were, there were some relationships. Um, and, um, uh, but nothing terribly long-term or terribly, probably very satisfying for him. Mm. Okay. And I think there were early on, there were two questions, uh, but uh, somehow it disappeared. I think one of them was from actually Wilson Lee was kind of asking if there's any connection uh, with the CACA, I believe is the organization. Oh, the, the, oh, the, the Citizens Origin. Alliance. Right, that was the right, Native, right. Native so, Sons of the Golden State. Right, uh, right, that yeah. came, actually, he was before that. His, um, his, um, um, uh, his organization, the one that Wang Qingfu set up, was actually before they set up hmm. the, um, uh, the Native Sons. I don't know of any interaction with it, although they did exist at the same time, because while he was um, looking for members for his organization, they, I think that's when they founded the Native Sons. But Wang didn't spend much time in California. Um, hmm. At one point, he came through California, and somebody put a price on his head because he had tried to save some Chinese women from prostitution. And I think he decided to get out of Dodge before somebody did him in. So he didn't spend much time on the West Coast at all. Oh, I see. But Ray Lu has a question about uh, Sun Yat-sen, and I promised to, yep. I promised to, um, um, to, to elaborate on that. Yep. Um, Sun Yat-sen, I think it was 1890. I want to say 1895. I could be wrong by a year or so. Sun Yat-sen took his first trip to mainland USA. He had been in Hawaii before, but never in the mainland. Mm. And um, he, he, trans he, he came out of the West Coast. He transversed the entire continent. And then from the East Coast, he went to London. And when he, was trying to, he was trying to raise money among overseas mm. Chinese for his, for his various causes. Um, he stopped in Chicago while Wang was in Chicago. And... I think it is almost unthinkable that he was in Chicago meeting with all the prominent Chinese hmm. and would not have spent some time with Wang Qingfu, who was after all publishing the Chinese newspaper at that point in Chicago. 
But that's speculation. I actually have proof that they that at some point they met. Um, if you know anything about Sun Yat-sen's history, you know that when he um, when he got to London, he actually was taken captive. Hmm. Um, the um, yep. the the Manchus wanted to kill him. They were uh, they were they were done with him. But he was you know as long as he was outside of China, they really couldn't get their hands on him. But um, the um, Chinese consul in um, in London, I guess the Chinese ambassador em uh, embassy in London, got a um, message from the Chinese embassy in Washington that that Wang Chin, that, that Sun Yat-sen was on his way to London and that they should try to get him there, try to grab him. So they essentially um, lured him into the Chinese embassy on a pretext and they kept him captive and he was captive there for a long time. Um, and the idea was they were gonna to try to smuggle him out hmm. and put him in a boat for, uh, for China and then they would uh, do him in. Uh, he was able to smuggle out a note um, to, uh, to one of his friends um, to, uh, to uh, inform them that he was being held captive. And the um, uh, Scotland Yard wasn't terribly interested in it, but they, they did, they hired some, I think some, some um, uh, security guards to sort of watch the embassy. And um, uh, eventually the newspapers in London got hold of it and they started putting pressure on the Chinese embassy and eventually they let him go because mm -hmm. the, uh, the pressure was too strong. And after he was released from the embassy, a couple of weeks later, he had a meeting with some Chinese, some, some British journalists, and he wanted to thank them for their help in, um, uh, in freeing him. And he produced a letter and he said, I, this, uh, this letter I've just received from the United States, this is proof that our uh, movement in America is very strong. A, a letter from my friends in America was what he said. Hmm. And the letter was signed by Wang Ching Wang Chief. And if he was a friend of his in America, then surely <laughs> they had met yeah. when he was in Chicago. So QED, I pretty much deduced that. Great, great. So we have, uh, I guess we have time for one more question uh, from uh, my fellow friend in Boston, uh, Zhu Jichou. Uh, I guess, is, you know, you mentioned, I guess, in your talk about, you know, he, he was uh, spent some time in Boston. Oh, yeah. So maybe a little bit more exactly when he was in Boston, what was he oh, doing? Book, maybe a little um, bit... Uh, it's yeah. in the book. There was a there was a hall that he spoke in. There it wasn't Faneuil Hall. It was another one. Mm. Um, it's in the book. I don't remember the name of it. But that is where he gave his first speech, his famous speech, where he announced to the United States, uh, to the Americans, that first of all he expressed his gratitude, tongue in cheek, his mm. gratitude to the Americans for sending these wonderful missionaries to China to uh, spread the light of Christianity in China. Mm. And he said, as a, and China, this is China's way of thanking you. I am China's first Confucian missionary to the United <laughs> States. And that happened in Boston. Um, I'll, I'll look it up. I, it's in the book. I know the name of the, uh, the hall where he actually um, gave the, uh, the presentation. But, but it was a, uh, it was very brief. I mean, his, his time in Boston was real. It was brief. I don't yeah. know where it is in enough record. Yeah. So. Um, he also um, um, had some, some dealings in Boston when he, was, um, uh, when he was trying to get the Exclusion Act repealed. Mm -hmm. Um, he was up there a couple of times then as well. Um, okay. Anyway, all in the book. Okay. That's a, so I guess uh, with that, everybody should definitely check it out. And, uh, you know, thank you so much, Scott, for uh, the, you thank know, very you. enlightening talk, you know, even though it's, it's great to meet you. Yep. Great <laughs> to meet you too in person, finally. So, uh, and I pass it back to Essa for closing remarks. Okay. Scott, thank you so much for this yes, important sir. book talk. And My I pleasure. have to agree with Stephanie, who um, typed it in the chat box. Even though I was also there eight years ago when you do the talk at the Ch uh, Chinese Social Society of New England, this is still very engaging. And I really need to tell all these attendants, I wasn't um, inspired until eight years ago. I was <laughs> at his book talk <laughs> that Wilson said, you need to go to listen to our history. And because of that, I'm sitting here today to do these webinar. So Scott, you have touched me and inspired me and thank you so much. And for the past um, you know, 10, 12 days we're doing webinar, there are already two webinar touching on your book or your research. Oh. One is Mocha, they mentioned your name, I think oh. is what you said, the, the research that mm. you did that they have. Mm -hmm. And plus um, the tongs, we talk about tongs and right, I believe right. David Lay had used your book as well as a reference. 
So thank you so much for writing all these books. My pleasure. And again, thank you every attendees for attending our webinar. Tomorrow actually is a nice transition of the next topic after what Scott did. Our topic tomorrow is pioneering Chinese student at MIT from 1877 to 1931. And actually, York is going to be our moderator again. So it's really exciting. Yep. Another have... great historian friend of mine. Emma. So very That's glad. Emma. Yes. Emma. Yep. Emma. Emma. Right. Emma Tang yeah. is going to be our presenter. So it will be a wonderful thing tomorrow to continue with this conversation. So hope you can join us too, Scott, tomorrow if you have time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK, so thank you so much uh, for joining us. So um, if you want to join us tomorrow, please go to our website cahf.us um, and you'll be able to see all the AAPI talks for 2022. So have a great night. Thank you again, Scott. My You're pleasure. wonderful. Thank you for Good having night. you have joining us this evening. Good night, okay, everybody. Thank you, York. Thank again. You. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so all right, much. See you tomorrow. All right. You tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.